So, so good. Good to see everybody. Good morning. Grab your Bibles. We are in a super fun, light, easy, seeker-friendly <laughs> summer series called Retaking Samaria. We've looked at lust. <laughs> that was fun. Uh, we've looked at uh, gluttony. And uh, today is greed. So grab your Bibles. I'll show you how this fits into this region known as Samaria that ultimately divides the people of God uh, and the nation of the Lord. An outline there for you. The title, some of you too young to remember, but uh, I'm hoping and counting on a good crew of us remembering a movie that came out and sort of one of those famous lines from the movie. Uh, the movie was a year before Bonnie and I got married. Uh, we got married in um, 1988. This came out in 87. It was called Wall Street. And Michael Douglas was the star and... Um, the character was Gordon Gecko. The title of today's message, The Gordon Gecko Lie. Gordon Gecko says, Greed is good. Became one of the most famous movie lines, probably right up there with Gone with the Wind. Although I've never seen that movie. Don't email me, but I, I've, never, I've never seen it. Um... Gecko was lying. Greed is not good. Um, in fact, greed is the opposite of good. Now, that's hard for all of us, uh, me included. I drove in this morning, saw a beautiful Jeep, and then a Tesla, right? And then this Mercedes, oh my gosh, and then the Porsche, and you're kind of like, and we have seen kind of an entire generation and society buy into this, this lie. And I know it isn't about you. It's not about you. It's, it's about all of them. So let's, <laughs> let's just spend a few moments talking about them and, and their issue with greed. And because uh, it certainly isn't me and. I'm, I'm, I'm convinced it isn't you, and uh, uh, if you're new, welcome. Let me catch you up to speed. If you have an outline and you're into taking notes, anyone, say amen. amen. Grab something to write with and um, uh, get caught up with me. Week one, lust is a dungeon. We, we saw this together, and there's an outline there for you as well to sort of fit into your nice little series pamphlet here, and, and, uh, and I love that quote right there in the outline from week one that Lewis gives to us, that lust is a, I love this, lust is a poor, weak, whimpering, whispering thing compared with that richness and energy of desire which will arise when, when lust has been killed. And so um, this is an area of our lives is taking a lot of people out, um, out of commission for all that the Lord has for them, um, lust is. And secondly, uh, the idea of week two is uh, to live not gluten-free, <laughs> glutton-free. <laughs> Living glutton Free and, uh, and, and this week, let's get the title right. Here's the title. Gordon Gecko got it backwards. He got it wrong. Fill it in with me. Greed is grief. Greed is grief. And uh, love to prove it to you, starting really with uh, the best place in the world to start, and that would be uh, the words of Jesus. So if you have a Bible, just going to sort of like thumb through with you a couple of the passages where, where Jesus talks about this. Uh, and, and he does so very, very clearly. Some would say he talked more about money than heaven and hell combined. Uh, whether that's true or not, some commentators would, would take that angle. What is true is this. He talked about the kingdom of heaven 
and, and declares as he arrives, the kingdom is here. The kingdom of heaven has arrived. And, uh, and he does so then in contrast to this earthly kingdom. And that's where this whole issue of materialism and, and greed comes into play. In, in the Sermon on the Mount there in Matthew chapter 6, um, just be reminded with me what he says. And then I want to give you an example of how this fits into the history of Samaria, which today does, as the screen and slides would suggest, it just it, it, it lies in a pile of ruins. And that's the last thing we want for you and from, from your life, uh, for your legacy. Uh, and so I want to give you that example and then sum things up uh, rather quickly with a wonderful story that I love so much out of, out of Genesis. But look with me here at the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter 6, uh, Jesus, beginning in verse 19, says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Okay, this is Jesus. He's got, he's got the best in store for you. He desires to see you blessed. And so he's not like, you know, stomping on, on your fun and jamming us up for our drive. Uh, he has something better in store. Lay up for yourselves, this is better, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth or rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal. Verse 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It's not the reverse. Sometimes we get it backwards and we think that where our heart is, that's where our treasure will be. No, 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 no. Where your treasure is, is exactly where you will find your heart hanging out. Luke chapter 12. Skip up with me to the Gospel of Luke. I love this series that we're going to launch together this fall going through the Gospels. Typically, as many of you know, here at Horizon, we'll take a book of the Bible, we'll just dissect that thing. This fall, we're taking four. <laughs> four, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we're going to lay it out, and it's sort of like a parallel study chronologically through the footsteps of Jesus. And here in Luke chapter 12, he picks up the same theme for us. And I want to kind of couch this into the context of what he shares in Luke chapter 12, uh, because what he ends up doing is he, he just clearly lays out the same uh, emphatic statement for us, but then would follow up with a parable, with a story that he would tell. But look at it with me here. In Luke chapter 12, in verse 13, the crowd said to him, one guy in the crowd in verse 13 sort of yells out to him and says, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And Jesus responds, very interesting response. Jesus said, man... Who made me a judge over, arbitrator over you? He said, take heed and beware of covetousness. Here's his answer, verse 15. Covetousness, another word for greed. For one's life, this is, this is wild. Come on, North County. Look at, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses. Wow. And he spoke a parable to them. He sort of broke it down with the, with the illustration to follow and said, a ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. He thought within himself saying, what, what should I do? Since I have no room to store my crops, I need more storage. <laughs> we talked about the storage, you know, that... That is a wild deal, you guys. Um, it's a $40 billion a year industry. Storage units, of which there are 55,523 units. Not individual units, but you know, sort of like the one that just on Encinitas Boulevard pulled down the strip mall, put up the storage. We need more room to store the stuff we don't have room to store at home, that's what this guy's talking about. If you were to look at the individual garages in all 55,000 of the storage units, you are now well over 25 million in this country alone. 
And this guy is faced with this dilemma. He's like, what, what am I going to do? To store everything. Verse 18, so he said, I'll do this. I will pull down my barns and I'll build greater barns. Let's go bigger. There I'll store all my crops and my goods. And I'll say to my soul, soul, <laughs> you have many good things laid up for many years. Take your ease. Take your ease and eat and drink and be merry. And God said to him, fool. You're a fool, fool, exclamation point, fool. This night your soul be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself. There's that, this is the kingdom contrast again, these two kingdoms, this earthly kingdom of, of wealth and greed and lust and gluttony and, 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 and this kingdom of God. So is he who lays up treasure for himself here and is not rich towards God he elaborates even further for us in Luke chapter 16. Look at this. Look at this. Jesus in verse 1 said to his disciples, there's a certain rich man who had a steward. An accusation was brought to him, brought, brought, brought to him that, that, that this man was wasting his, he's just wasting his life. He's wasting his resources. He's not, this guy, Jesus, this guy is being a bad steward. So they called him and they said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship. For you can no longer be a steward. And the steward said within himself, what in the world am I going to do? This is, my, this is my life. This is my purpose. This is my meaning. This is my degree. This is my identity. What am I going to do? My master is taking the stewardship away from me. And I can't dig, he's like admitting, confessing. I'm, I'm too old to go back into the field. I'm too, I'm, I'm too old for manual labor and I'm too proud to beg. Look what he says. I can't dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I've resolved what I'll do. That when I'm put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. And so he called every one of his master's debtors to him. And he said to him, how much do you owe my master? And they said, well, I owe your master a hundred denarii of oil. And he said, well, quick, take your bill, sit down and, and write 50. Let's just settle something, a bird in the hand, right? You with me? It's better than two out there in the bush. He's like, just, just write 50. Let's just like, let's settle this. And then another said, well, how much... Do you owe? And he said, well, 100 measures of wheat. And he said, well, you take your bill. Quick, you write 80. And the master commended the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly. Now note this, please note. Again, we're talking about two contrasting kingdoms. One down here that is easy for us to get sucked into and to live for, and, and one up here that is eternal, everlasting, and forever. And so here he's like comparing this again, and, and, and he's like, He's like, this guy's dealing shrewdly. And then he says this, wild insight, verse eight, for the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. In other words, they, they know how to work it down here. And ultimately, that's all gonna burn, but in the moment here, they're not getting any credit for the ultimate kingdom that will last forever, but it's simply pointing out that a lot of folks down here sort of get the spin of how to work the deal, and he's like, this guy's, this guy's working it, this guy's shrewd. And I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon, that when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home, for he who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much, and he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to you the, 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 the trust of the true riches? Again, these two colliding, contrasting, comparing kingdoms. And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? For no servant, verse 13, and here's what's on your outline, no servant can serve two masters. And we kind of think we can. We kind of think we can have one foot in the kingdom of this world and and, and, and one foot there in heaven, and it's, it's sort of like when you've got one foot on the boat and one foot on the dock, right? 
And he's like, you can't serve both. You can't serve two masters. Either you're going to hate the one and love the other, or else you will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Another word for money. And so he lays it out, Jesus does, and speaks into so much to which if we were truly honest in church this morning, we need to hear this. Because we can easily get so sucked in, wrapped around this world and all of its goods and possessions. No, 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 Bob, I've got this. I've got this. I got, I got this. I can handle it. I got it under control. Well, the Lord asked me to send you an emoji. Here it is. <laughs> you don't have it. I don't have it. And if we don't admit that we don't have it, it has us. And I think so much if we were to unpack our, our lives, it's, it's, it's probably the Lord even like right now in heaven just kind of like, no, because we end up so much of our pursuits in terms of going after things that in the end don't matter. No, no, I got this. I can, you know, you, you scratch the surface from just about any subject that you want to consider. Even this gender war right now that is raging in our society. Come on, let's be honest. This, this whole gender war that is raging, just, just underneath the surface, at the heart of it is greed. It's greed. It's the problem in the Garden of Eden to which they have been given everything to enjoy where life is concerned and it isn't enough. I just need a little bit more. I need the next newest, biggest, shiniest thing that now takes us into this realm of raging over the way in which he has chosen in his sovereignty to fashion us and knit us together in our mother's wombs and, and, and that's not enough. I want to be able to decide, right, to the extent now that you have guys that are entering into girls' athletic races to set new records that will always have asterisks next to them, to win trophies that ultimately will sit on a shelf and tarnish. You guys, seriously, what's at the heart of that if it isn't greed? And maybe what we need to realize, fill this in on your outline, let's, let's do this together. You feel like filling some things in? Come on, in this war of identity, the most dangerous pronouns You already know, Phil, I mean, they've always been, what? Me and mine. And, and, and I grieve for the kids that are back to college and ha having sort of sat down in their classes for this new fall semester and been given the syllabus, their, their first response is which pronouns they're gonna be known for and the most destructive and dangerous ones of all are the ones that would associate us with this earthly kingdom of thinking that it's all about me and it's all about mine as opposed to this everlasting kingdom of God where our pronouns, what if our pronouns, what if you went into class and you just like, well, what are your pronouns? Him and his. To him be the honor and the glory for his grace has set me free from all of the chains of this destructive world. Hallelujah. I mean, that is so much the truth, you guys. And when the disciples are like to the point of saying, wow, are your prayers ever awesome. Teach us to pray. How do you pray? And he goes, pray like this. Pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, his name. Pronouns from here on out, church. Thy and him and his. Like he goes on in the prayer and he goes, let's get specifically practical about this. Pray thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Where? Where? On earth. That is the challenge for Josh Dyer and Steve Case, our children's pastor and youth minister in terms of just helping with the dialogue of kids that find themselves fully immersed in a me and my kingdom. 
to one now in which the Lord says, no, 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 fill this in. He calls a kingdom, get this, look at, look at, he calls a kingdom of transformed. Like, what a, what a word that has come under attack. Trans. And here, you can just see the strategy and ploy of Satan in terms of wanting to get his hooks and grips into this culture and generation. Where trans has now become, no, 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 all since the very beginning, it has been the heart of God to call together a kingdom of transformed people with the purpose then of transforming this society. We are, we, we, we are those people today, my friends, we are the ones that have been called by his grace to both be transformed by his salvation and then to go and transform others. I have a baby dedication at the 11 o'clock. It's actually Nathan Patterson, part of our security team. And Leah, who many of you know so well because she's helped in the raising of your kids in our children's ministry. And, and I was just thinking about when, when, when I got dedicated as a baby, and I don't remember it, but it certainly had a impact on my life and the extent that it sort of just became this, 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 this highlight that was pointed to by my folks for the rest of my days. I was dedicated at the People's Church in Toronto by Oswald J. Smith, to which his probably favorite quote is this. He says, the world doesn't need a sermon, it needs a message. And our message, church, is simply this, that we are to be these transformed people that are now speaking into a, a lost world and a satanic agenda that is taking that same word now and trying to destroy it, just like the rainbow. Don't you sort of just like the rainbow belongs to God, the rainbow is his, and God wants his rainbow back. <laughs> sort of like, uh, I hate that you even put that up there. It is just so, you better get used to it because it's just not a part of our past in terms of being part of the story of Noah and the flood. Do you realize this rainbow, read Revelation chapter four, is what you see over the throne of God every time you look to him for eternity. That is the reminder that he is a covenant-keeping God that has the ability to trans Form his people and then to send us out to transform society. And yet we can't if we have got sucked into everything else that the society believes and lives for. I think Tozer is, is right up there with Lewis. If I could give you a Tozer quote that you might want to snap a pic of or just jot this down on the back of your outline. A.W. Tozer, I mean right up there with Lewis. It's time for me to throw you a Tozer quote. He said, things, everyone say things. Things, things Jeeps and Porsches and all wow, that house on that hill. He looks so happy up there. <laughs> things have become what is necessary to us. In fact, that is a development never in, originally intended. It was never the plan. God's gifts have taken the place of God. Boom. Nailed it. And as a result of that, the whole course of nature has been upset by this monstrous substitution. And if we're not careful, what happens to Israel in terms of seeing its kingdom divided, now pulled in opposite direction with Judah down in the south and Samaria up north, if this is not territory in our hearts and lives, along with lust and along with gluttony, it's not, not gluten-free. I mean, I think that's the same devil that dropped or added the, 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 the S in fast food, you know, it's the same devil that took glutton free and made it gluten free. And don't email me. Jesus is the one who said, I am the bread of life. So um, it's kind of like, what in the world happens to the heart like in this 
dramatic symbolism of Israel that now finds itself imploding and defeated from within. It, it, it isn't the, the, the risk of Rome moving in on Israel. It's Israel, hello, wake up America. It's the very fact that the nations itself from within has divided and ours will as well, my dear friends, unless we allow him to retake some area. And for us today, that area is greed because it's what happened in Samaria. Can I show you? Turn to 1 Kings. 1 Kings right there on your outline is where we are. And it's in chapter 16 that this guy shows up. He's probably the worst king of, of all. And you, you, you've heard of him. You know him. You know him well. Let me back up a little bit into verse 21 of 1 Kings chapter 16. The people of, of Israel were divided. Here we go. Divided in two parts. Half of the people followed Tibni, the son of Gibna. You're like, oh, I haven't heard of him. Okay, just hold on. Make, and made king, the rest of them followed Omri. Verse 22, the people who followed Omri prevailed over the people who followed Tibni, the son of Gibna. So Tibni died and Omri reigned. The 31st year of Asa, the king of Judah, Omri became the king over Israel, and he reigned 12 years. Six years he reigned in Tizra, and he, here we go, verse 24, here's what, here's what I want you to see. And he bought the hill of Samaria from Shemer for two talents of silver, and he built on the hill, and he called the name of the city, which he built Samaria, after the name of Shemer, the owner of the hill. Okay, so there's where Samaria gets purchased and becomes part now of the legacy, now becoming the northern capital of the divided kingdom, Israel to the north and Judah to the south. We, we saw that last time. And Omri, verse 25, did evil in the eyes of the Lord and did worse than all who were before him. Wow. Wow. For he walked in all the ways of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and in his sin by which he had made Israel sin, provoking the Lord God of Israel to anger with their idols. And lust can become an idol, right? And gluttony can become an idol. We need to be glutton free. And certainly greed now laid before us this morning in this study can become an issue of idolatry, all of which provokes the Lord God of Israel to anger. Doesn't end well for this guy. Verse 27, look what happens. The rest of the acts of Omri, which he did, and the might that he showed, are they not written in the books of the Chronicles of the Kings? So, so 1 Kings, as well as 1 Chronicles, records the horrible, sad legacy of this guy but the worst has yet to be written it's in the next verse verse 28 and so Omri rested with his fathers and was buried in Samaria and Ahab his son reigned in his place now there's the guy you've heard of in the 38th year of Asa the king of Judah Ahab remember Ahab and Jezebel here he is the son of Omri became king over Israel, and Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria 22 years. Get this, verse 30. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. More than his dad. And it came to pass, as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians. And he went and he served Baal. This guy bails on the God of Israel and takes his wife and succumbs to a life of division and compromise as he now chooses to both worship and serve, worship and serve Baal. He went and he served Baal and worshiped him, the end of verse 31. And he set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a wooden image. Ahab did more 
Come on, verse 30, look at this. More to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. So, oh man, not how you want to be known. And in the days of Hael, of Bethel, he built Jericho. Okay, that's greedy. I mean, greedy enough for him to bail on the God of Israel and go serve and worship Baal is pretty much the formation of a God that looks like yourself instead of worshiping the God who made you in his image. Greed would say being made in his image ain't cutting it. I want to be made in my own image, me and mine, to the extent now that even Samaria as a city wasn't enough. We need to rebuild Jericho, which was in the region of Samaria. Rebuild that city. And he laid its foundations with Abram, his firstborn, and with his youngest son, Sagub. He set up its gate. It cost him the life of his firstborn, which was everything. In Israel, we talk about the legacy of the firstborn throughout all of the pages of Scripture. He loses his firstborn and he loses his youngest son in this greedy effort of rebuilding Jericho. He rebuilt it, even though there had been a warning. Look at this, the end of verse 34. According to the word of the Lord, which he had spoken through Joshua, the son of Nun. What's that mean? What does that mean? Well, I pulled it up for you. Joshua, at the end of chapter 6, gives the people that warning. They have just seen this incredible victory. It's the first victory now that they have launched themselves after 40 years of the wilderness into the promised land. And the first victory is brought to them by the hands of, of, of Jehovah Yahweh alone. All they did was walk around silently around those city walls. And then all of a sudden on the seventh day, they came crashing down. You know the story. And God said, don't take any of the reward. All of this belongs to the Lord. Bless the Lord with this victory that he has given you, that he has bestowed upon you. Give him great glory and honor for going before you and destroying your enemies. And then Joshua gives this warning. Joshua warned them at that time and said, cursed is going to be the guy. Now, this is like hundreds of years before the reign of Ahab, to which Joshua would have warned them. Whoever rises up and builds the city of Jericho is going to lay its foundation with his firstborn. And also with his youngest son, he will set up its gates. And, 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 and the cost then is clear, right, of ultimately what happens when we choose this world's kingdom over over the kingdom of our God. And yet that's where we find ourselves, with bankruptcy statistics, as many of you know even better than I do, that have never been as sky high as they are right now. And this whole issue of loan and debt forgiveness and so it's not sitting well in the country and as a society, regardless of which side of the aisle you find yourself on. I, I just want to publicly declare that my credit cards are now identifying as student loans. That's... <laughs> a, a, for me, that just is a brilliant move on their part to identify now as student debt. No. Now, all of the reasons for divorce that you could possibly gather together, there is one that far exceeds the rest, and you, you could gather all of the other ones and combine them and still come up short to the number one reason why people get divorced. And it's over money. And it'll, it'll get you regardless of where you are on the spectrum. It'll, it'll, it'll get you if you've got a lot. And it'll get you if you don't. I mean, it's actually when they have nothing, really nothing, that the Lord adds this to his 
kingdom purposes and standards for living. They're at the base of Mount Sinai, really with nothing to show for anything, right? And they're, 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 they're like to the point of saying we have nothing to show for anything to the extent that we, we actually think it would be a better move for us to return back and become slaves in Egypt. At least we had. And right there in that moment, God through Moses would grant them these 10 commandments to which on the list is what? Thou shall not covet. They're in the desert. Covet what? Right? So he gets very specific about it. He says, don't covet your neighbor's wife or your neighbor's tent that is like two feet away from, oh, well, look at how, look at their nice tent. Man, they got a really nice tent. <laughs> or your neighbor's donkey. It'll get you at whatever level. I just want you so much to know that Gecko's lying. Ge Ge Gordon Gecko is simply echoing the words of the serpent. The Gecko is saying what the serpent is always. The greed is good. And here, even in the desert, the Lord is saying, don't let this Rob your heart. Don't covet. Don't get greedy. Don't get, and I know it's rough because since last Sunday, when some, most of you were here, since last Sunday, Bezos has made another $1.75 billion in a week. And a lot of us contributed more to his wealth than we have given to the kingdom of God. Musk makes 51 million an hour. It's not just Gordon Gecko that's promoting this lie. Even Jordan Peterson, who's probably the best thing that's come out of Canada in a long time, makes the mistake of saying that greed is a good motivator. Come on, you guys. We're to be Kingdom people transformed and not caught in the trap of all this. You, you, whether you want to call it communism or socialism or capitalism, it's the same demon in a different costume. And here Jesus comes along with a much better approach to life. And so I ask myself some questions. I, I don't know, maybe you want to ask them too. They're here on the outline. How about it? Would I spend it differently With a year left, or how much do you want to give yourself? How much is left? You got a month left. Would you spend it? Would we see it and spend it differently if we really believed? I mean, you're watching everything as I'm watching everything in the world. Just, I mean, all of it point to the reality that he's about to return, you guys. The Lord's coming back. And so uh, with that reality sort of being reminded to us on this glorious Lord's Sunday morning, the last Sunday of the summer, the last Sunday of August, if you had a month left, would you spend it differently? What would you go after? I mean, what would you really invest in if you had a week left, if you had a year left? Because I mean, I, 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 only the Lord knows the number of our days, but I think we would all agree this morning that the days are short. How would we, how, how would we just allow this to transform us so that this area truly comes under his control and surrender, huh? Maybe second question helps with the first one. Is, is, my, is, is our source of security? Because that, that really becomes kind of the clutch of the matter, right? So is, is our security in heaven or here? Because if it's here, then you're going to have a hard time loosening the grip on it. Because you're going to think it's what secures you. Right? Like that story of the, the, these monkeys that are just attacking this guy's farm. He doesn't know how to get rid of the monkeys. And finally a guy shows up and he goes, I know exactly how to get rid of the monkeys. And he, he takes this coconut and he carves out this small little, drills this hole in the coconut and, and then empties out the coconut and fills the the coconut with pecans, fills it up with nuts. Just, just, just enough for the monkey to get his hand in there and to grab the nuts, right? 
He goes, I can get rid of the monkeys for you. And he drills out the coconut and he fills it up with pecans. He fills it up with nuts. And the monkey gets his greedy grips in there and he grabs the nuts. But then he can't, he can't pull his hand out of the coconut. He can't pull his hand out without releasing his grip on that. He won't let go of the nuts. And the guy just simply comes up, puts a bag on the monkey who won't let go of the coconut. And If I think that the security is all here, I'm not going to let go. But if I truly believe the source of my security is in heaven, you guys, that's where it is. Thirdly, does wealth determine my lifestyle or does service? Because ultimately what we're desiring to hear him say is, well done, good and faithful servant. We can't wait to hear the Lord say that to us. It's what we're living for. Lord, I can't wait to hear you say, well done, good and faithful. But am I being good and faithful? Am I even serving if I think that it's wealth and the accumulation of it that determines my lifestyle? What if service determines the lifestyle more than spending? And could selfishness, number four, could selfishness be disguised as self-interest? Because that's what we do, right? We're kind of like, this isn't selfishness. This is survival. You have, Bob, you have no idea the pressure that I'm under out there, right? One guy said to me, it cost me an extra 10 grand a month just to live at this rancho lifestyle. He is drowning, ultimately, is what he is saying to me confessing his drowning he's sort of just like um it's self-interest the guy who is saying that this selfishness is in the name of self-interest is the same guy who thinks porn is sex same guy who thinks gambling is investing (laughs) same guy who thinks alcohol is courage same guy who thinks the nightly news is actual real facts or that social media is reality, or that business books has anything to do with business. It's kind of like, are we getting sucked in and duped as monkeys? Or, number five, what if, what if contentment, oh, there's a good, there's a good word. What if contentment came not from gaining, but from giving? Because that would put us much more into the very heart and nature of God. For God so loved the world that he gave. He gave. What if contentment? What if we're on to something right now? What if, what if, what if? Because this whole racial divided world right now, that doesn't even come close to the economic segregation that is upon us as a culture. We all kind of wonder, what's he going to say when we get to the gates there in heaven? Is there going to be like a quiz? Like when I was handed the outline on the way in this morning, the usher or the deacon or the guest or the host or whatever we call them at the front door, I don't even know anymore. There'll be a test. There'll be a quiz. There'll be a quiz. What will be the quiz? Virgin birth? Virgin birth? Inerrancy of scripture? Deity of Christ? Rapture of the church? Speaking in tongues? Do you agree? Strongly disagree? Disagree? Agree? He tells us exactly the questions that he's going to ask us. What's he going to ask? What's he going to ask, you guys? I was hungry. Did you feed me? I was naked. Did you clothe me? I was in prison. Did you visit me? I was an orphan. Did you take me in? For when you did it unto the least of these, my brethren, you did it unto me. I do, I, f- I, f- I feel your pain, I feel the weight of that, I, f- I feel like 
where is my transformed life? Because if I don't do it to the least of these, he then goes on and says, you have failed to do it unto me. What if, what if contentment came from us just, just giving it away? Giving it away like we got a month to give it all away. Here's the story I want to wrap things up with, and then the band will come up and we'll set our sights on next weekend, which will be a wonderful time of celebrating communion and ushering in this fall ministry and just having a glorious time together. I hope you don't miss it. But, but I want you to just be reminded of what happens in the story of Joseph in the 43rd chapter of Genesis. You, you might just sort of like soak this in because it's in the midst of them meeting with Joseph and yet still not connecting the dots to realize he's their brother. They think he's just like the number two in command, Egyptian looking guy with the headdress on and the whole Steve Martin thing. They just didn't even realize that that's Joseph, right? And he goes, he goes you're going to leave one of the brothers here with me, sort of as the guarantee that you're all going to come back, but I want you to go home and bring the other brother that you didn't bring, and that's Joseph's favorite, Benjamin. So all these guys are like, Simeon, we hope to see you soon, and they leave Simeon behind, and they hightail it back up to dad, ultimately to grab Benjamin, and in doing so, something crazy happens And they realize along their journey home that someone's put a bunch of money in their saddlebags. They're like, where in the world, where did did this come from? And and they finally get home and they report back to their dad. Look, Look at verse 11. This is Genesis 43, verse 11. And their father Israel, remember that's Jacob. Jacob. Jacob means cheater, conniver, right? Greedy guy. And yet he has it out with the Lord who ultimately at the end of that wrestling match renames Jacob. He goes, no longer am I going to call you cheater. No longer am I going to call you the greedy conniver. I'm going to call you Israel. Israel means governed by God. And so their father Israel, verse 11, said to them, if it must be so, then do this. And that's sort of in response to, they made us leave Simeon and told us to bring back Benjamin. And here Israel, governed by God, says, if it must be so, then then do this and take some of the best fruits of the land in your vessels and carry down a present for the man. A little balm and a little honey and some spices and myrrh and pistachio nuts and almonds and take double money in your hand and and take back, look at this, take back in your hand the money that was returned in the mouth of your sacks, in your saddlebags. Perhaps it was an oversight. In other words, he doesn't get greedy. He's now governed by God. He's like, oh, wow, look at the money. I found finders keepers. No, he's sort of, he's sort of like, um, hey, return, guys, return all of that that just mysteriously somehow, who knows, showed up in your saddlebags. Send that all back and then double that. And take your brother also, verse 13, and rise and go back to the man. And may God, here's his prayer, may God Almighty give you mercy before the man, not knowing the man is Joseph, right? Give you mercy before him that he may release your older brother and Benjamin. If I'm bereaved, I'm bereaved. That is so Jewish. If I'm bereaved, I'm bereaved, he says. So the men took that present and Benjamin and they took double the money in their hand and they arose and they went down to Egypt and they stood before Joseph. Watch this, how, watch, watch how this goes down. You know this story? And Joseph saw Benjamin with them and he said to the steward of the house, take these men to my home and slaughter the animal and make ready for these men are gonna dine with me at noon. Big banquet, big noon banquet. And the man did as Joseph ordered, and the man brought the men into Joseph's house, and the men were afraid. They were like totally freaked out by this. They're like, what does this mean? He's brought us into Joseph's house. And they said, is it because of the money? It's because of the money, which, which we returned in our sacks the first time that we, that, that, that we are brought, in, brought into his, his house. He's going to slaughter us. We're the meal at noon, they're thinking. So that he may make the case against us and seize us and take us as slaves with our donkeys. 
And they drew near to the steward of Joseph's house, and they talked with him at the door of the house and said, Oh, sir, they're shaking in their boots right now. Sir, we indeed, we indeed came down the first time to buy food, but it happened when we came into the encampment that we opened up our saddlebags, we opened our sacks, and there each man's money was in its mouth of his sack. Our money is full weight, but, but we, have, we brought it back. We brought it back in our hand. We have brought down other money in our hand to buy food. We don't, we, we don't know. We don't know who put the money in our saddlebags. I love this. Verse 23, and he said, Peace be with you. And don't be afraid. For your God and the God of your Father has given you treasure in your sacks. Where's it come from? Oh man, it comes from me. I work hard for every, every good and perfect gift comes from God. It's the Lord. It's the Lord God. Your God and the God of your father has given you treasure in your sacks. I had your money. You brought Simeon out to them. It's the, it's, it's the Lord's. And when Bon and I first entered into the ministry, we went we went, a, we went 11 months, I was going to say a year. I don't know if we would have made it a year. We went 11 months without a paycheck. And we were, I was like 20, 26, 27 years old. And every day we'd go to the post office and she could tell by the look on my face when I came out of the post office door whether or not there was anything in there. And for all 11 months, our rent got paid. I have no idea to this day who did that. Grocery sto- showed up at our, our front door and, 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 and money in the mail, like, like the exact amount that we were needing. We, 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 never, we never missed a bill. This church has never missed a bill. This church is a miracle of God's faithfulness and grace. It's his, and he will multiply it if you simply allow yourself to realize it's not yours, it's his. The school is a miracle. The very fact that we have a football team is a miracle, and that we got to play Borrego Springs at home because it was 116 in Borrego Springs, that's a miracle. And that we won the game, that's a miracle. It's just like... My head that's exploding, it's the Lord's. Fill this in, fill it in. You know what? Gaining a true view of whose it is. Whose is it? It's his. Let's get rid of the pronouns of this kingdom of the world that we think it's me and we think it's my, it's his. To him, be the glory and honor both now and forever to gain a, a true view of whose it is will yield you some eternal rewards both now and forever in Jesus' name. Now let's be careful. That, that could be a, a careful fill-in right there because all of a sudden... We'll, we'll, we'll leave here with this idea that we give to gain. We don't give to gain. That's another church. That's a jacked up prosperity doctrine that is built much more on the foundational principles of the kingdom of this world. We don't give to gain. We gain to give. And may we, with all of our gaining, give him the glory and not settle for anything short of that church my favorite of all lewis quotes is right there for you on the out this is my fave it's the best of all his quotes that the lord finds our desires not too strong he finds our desires too weak for we are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he can't imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea, we are far too easily pleased. And, and we, we settle for that. 
when God has so much more. And so, and so church, make your pronouns from here on out him and, and his instead of me and mine because he has purposed and ordained you for such a time as this. He has you here. No coincidence that you've been here to hear this message. He's got incredible things in store for you as he did for Joseph and his brothers as, as, as they reunite and the next thing that happens is sort of like, you guys, it's me. Joseph is a picture of Jesus for all of us this morning. And it's him and it's him alone that deserves our praise. So live for his honor and for his glory and in all that he is stewarded into your saddlebags. Because the enemy wants to wreck God's plan and he'll wreck it through greed and he'll wreck it through lust and he'll wreck it through gluttony so that the cares of this world begin to choke out the seed of, of faith. That's his MO, that's his strategy even right now in having heard this message he wants to choke out the truth but this this ground of your heart where the seed of faith resides it has to be protected from all the cares of this world it has to be protected because this is holy ground to which the Lord has given to you his son, our savior, to redeem us, and fill us with his spirit and use us for his glory both now and forever. Would you stand with me? Lord, we do. We praise you and bless you and thank you that we can Surrender these areas of, of, of our heart and of our lives. And you tell us, Lord, you tell us if we confess our sin that you're faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. It's more than just forgiveness, isn't it, church, that we need? It's more than just forgiveness. We need to be cleansed from all of the junk and crud of this fallen earthly kingdom. And so, Lord Jesus Christ, we pray that you would wash us fresh and cleanse us by the water of your living word and fill us to overflowing with gratitude and thankfulness for all that you have given to us. And may we live our days for your honor and for your glory, both now and forever. In Jesus' name, come on, amen.